you struggle to get your buyers to buy in to what you're selling, well, this episode will show you how to uncover their real business needs so it becomes a no-brainer. Keep watching to find out how. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Sales Man podcast, the world's biggest B2B sales show where we help you not just hit your sales target. We help you thrive in sales. On today's show, we have Misha McPherson. She is the CEO of Humble Grit Sales. She is a SaaS and enterprise B2B sales expert. On today's show, we're diving into how to uncover the real buying needs of your customers and potential customers. And so with that all said, let's jump right in. Misha, welcome to the Sales and Podcast. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here today. I'm happy to have you on. So we're going to dive into uncovering the business needs um, and just the general needs as well, because I guess we'll get down to a personal level as we go through this conversation. But first off, are there any are there any high level overarching business needs that everyone we speak to when we're selling a product or service that they have, even if I guess they don't realize that they have? Yeah. So I think that one of the things that we always have that we we often forget as salespeople is that every single person has been brought into a company to do a specific job. Right. And they, so with those specific jobs, there are specific needs that that need to be met. Um, so whether you're talking to a CEO or down to a VP or down to a director or down to an end user, everybody is there in order to produce results. It's really it's about uncovering what results they need to produce. That so blow mind already, because that is a question that I feel maybe there's a way we can word it. And we can work through this. But if we can ask a potential customer that we know can benefit from our product, essentially what what they're there for. It tells us the one direct metric that we can perhaps help them with, if that makes sense. How would we go about asking someone that question without being as blunt as, why, why, why are you here? <laughs> so one of my favorite things that I like to look at when I'm talking to somebody is how long they've been at the company, because that is something that gives me some very specific direction. Uh, my favorite people to sell to are people who've been at the company for six months or less, right? Because especially if they're, if they're a director or above and they've been there for six months or below, they have, they have a bit of a chip on their shoulder. They have something that they need to show why they, why specifically they were hired. Um, so I, so when going into those types of discovery questions, I think, first of all, it's really important to understand what each one of these roles do. You need to know your buyer um, so that you know typically what that type of buyer typically what they're being judged upon. And then you can ask a very specific question that relates to one of those criteria. Um, I think it's important not to be generic here um, because we don't want them to think that we are, that we're just a random person off the street who doesn't know their business. We want that. We want them to, to know as soon as possible that we actually know their business as well as they do. Okay. So we're going to come back on to knowing the buyer, if there's any processes, especially if there's new salespeople listening in a new vertical or even seasoned ver uh, people in a new regional area or new vertical. We'll come on to that in a second. But something you um, you said, and we're going to sidetrack away from the, the gist of the conversation here for a second, but I think it's really important and it could be really valuable for the audience. And that is, do you have a process or some way of monitoring when someone gets into a new role, when they're in that six month period where they've got a chip on the shoulder, because that kind of trigger event is clearly super valuable data that makes a lot of this make a lot more sense when we're having these conversations. Yeah, so it, we're in a really fascinating time because there's more and more technology that is there to help us with things exactly like that. So every company is going to have a different sales tech stack um, that they have. But one of the ones that I really like is Sales Navigator. You know, Sales Navigator has been around for a while now. It's a fairly easy one. Um, so I think it, it's one of those questions to ask. Um, if you're at a larger company, especially, make sure that you're going back to your sales ops team or your sales enablement team and specifically ask which tools they have or are putting in place for that. Um, if you don't have access to a sales ops team or you don't have access to the tools, um, the easiest way to use it to, to the easiest thing to do is actually just use LinkedIn, even on the free level, just to have a quick little glance at when this, how long this person has been at that company. And does this translate then for someone perhaps who has been at a company for 10 years? Should we, is a smarter question to ask perhaps rather than what are your goals? Would it be a smart question to ask what are your goals this quarter or what's come up in the past six months that is more important than all the, the rest of the stuff that you just do day to day? Oh, that, that, absolutely. So I think one of the things that makes us stand out as salespeople 
is when we make sure that we're changing the question based on the person we're talking to, right? So it's not even just this quarter. If it's the beginning of their fiscal year or their end of their fiscal year, bringing that up, I think, is really important. Um, if they're end of the quarter, you know, bringing up, you know, bringing up that. Um, different types of orgs are going to have different types of deadlines, right? So if you're selling, if you are a salesperson and selling into sales, you know, obviously, you know, they are going to be very much tied most likely to a quarterly number or a monthly number and an annual number. Um, if it's going to be marketing, it's probably a little bit more drawn out. So making sure that you really understand if you're selling to engineering, when when are those big changes? How long are they working on these projects? So that your question can be not generic and very specific to that buyer. Do we need to go into a, a discovery conversation with some assumptions? Because there seems like a balance here between having um, some assumptions that shows that you are uh, knowledgeable within your space. It makes you stand out versus someone who comes in with a load of horrible questions that puts everyone everyone's backs up and shows you that you've not made any effort whatsoever. There seems to be a balance here between assumptions and then having a, a bespoke solution or a bespoke plan. Or um, you said something here down that I've jotted down that I can't read my own handwriting on, of a specific, being specific to the job, nothing to do with your product, getting it nailed down to them. How do we get that balance and how, how, how much assumption do we need to ask better questions? So first of all, the, the best salespeople that I know, um, the ones that, that just, they hit their number every single quarter, the ones that are just, who are, this is a craft for them, it's not just a job, they typically are fairly paranoid. Um, and I think that's a really good thing to be paranoid. Um, you should know as much as you can possibly know about the, t the verticals that you're selling into, the industries that you're selling into, the types of buyers, nerd out on it like it's your job um, because it is. But then I think the hard part, the trick to it is your job is not to impress your buyer with how much you know. They don't care. <laughs> they really, really don't. Um, the point of knowing so much about the buyer and the industries and the companies and all of this stuff, the point to it is so that when you come to the table and you can start having that conversation, the tone of the conversation is very different. The tone of the conversation is very much an expert talking to an expert, not some, some annoying salesperson who is calling to ask a bunch of questions because somebody told them to ask those questions. So I think that there is very much a balance. And I think where especially people who are just getting started using this type of technique, where you have to be really careful is not showing off all of that knowledge that you have built up. Um, but using it much more specifically to ask questions that the buyer cares about. So I'm going to ask this, and it, I, I hope I know where you'd go with it, but I'm going to ask it just for clarity for the audience and to make this clear for them. Is this a this tone of being an expert, uh, not necessarily a thought leader, but maybe a thought leader within tiny little kind of vertical? So for me, medical devices, I probably knew more about urology endoscopy products more than anyone else in Yorkshire, because I'd worked for both of the leading competitors. So the surgeons knew that they could call me with their problems and I'd help them, whatever the product was, if I could get get them on the phone and if I could kind of send them a plan solution or, or talk them through something. So when I say thought, thought leader, I mean like super micro, mega niche thought leader. So it, we're, we're trying to build that tone. Is it a perceived tone of being an expert or is it a genuine tone of you are a damn expert in this field because you've worked damn hard to to build all that knowledge over the time. So, you know, I so first of all, and I think it's hard too, right? Because how do you get to that level of expertise? You you yourself probably worked, it took you a long time to get that knowledge um, and to get that expertise. So a couple of points, and one of the points is going to sound like it's going off on a tangent and it's not. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why it's really important to like what you sell. Um, if you're selling something and you realize at the end of the day, you really don't care about it. Um, it's time to start looking for the next job because you're, it's going to be real. It's going to be so much harder for you to become an expert in something if you don't care about it. Um, and then as far as, um, perception versus real, I think is the more real, real you can make it, the better. Um, initially it's gotta be, so initially when you're first getting uh, into a role, I think this is a this is an area where it's important to ask questions that you genuinely are curious about, because you're not just selling them; you're also learning, 
right? You're learning about their business. You're learning about those types of buyers. And I think it's absolutely valid and okay to ask good questions that will help you learn those things. Um, and then over time, as you become an expert, I think it's okay to also show that you actually really do know your stuff um, and share that stuff with them. You might, you might indeed know it better than they do. Um, and what a valuable conversation it is to have um, with somebody who knows, who really knows their business. So as we go through these, these uh, discovery questions and the discovery process, where in the, the context of the sales process as a whole does it, this come? Is it, is it right at the beginning? Is this what we do to kind of uphinge any potential objections and then we never come back to it? Is it an ongoing process? How, how do we manage these questions that we're asking? I love that question because I feel like this is an area where a lot of people make a mistake. And once again, the, the truly the paranoid sales reps don't make this mistake. Um, discovery is something that happens from the very begin, beginning to the very end. Um, when you're getting ready to get that contract signed, you're probably the best ones are still doing, they're still asking a lot of questions. They're still uncovering um, potential roadblocks to the, to the deal. They're still uh, understanding before the, if there's a CSM involved or a post sales team, they're still identifying what things that post sale team is going to work on. Um, the best sales reps don't look at discovery as a stage in the sales process. The best ones do it throughout the entire process. And is uh, there may not be an answer to this, but is there any data on that shows that, or is that anecdotal? Oh, I'm sure that there is, and I can't tell you off off. Um, I can't tell you off the top of my head what that data looks like, but I have zero doubt that it has been researched quite a bit. Okay, awesome. Right. So if we are going into a, a meeting and we know that we can solve a problem, we know that from our external research that there's perhaps a, some kind of trigger event, someone's moved uh, organizations so that they're, they're hot to make their mark. The, we know that they've got the budget, they've just spent this or they've had funding or something's come in. Um, all the banter kind of questions have all been answered and we sit down opposite someone um, and we can use this from two contexts from the perhaps someone in the C-suite and an end user as well. We'll see what the difference is between what their needs are. How do we know when we've actually hit the right need and not the fact that they've just told us what we want to hear? And then two, how do we know when to shut the hell up? Because we've, we've done it, we've got to that point and we don't need to ask any more questions because after a certain point in time, you're just sucking you know, their meeting time and, and their day away from them, right? Yeah. Um, one of my one of my reps, I, I loved this so much. One of my reps used to put himself on, on mute. If it was a phone call, he would put himself on mute after he would ask a question to make sure that he didn't keep going. I love that. So as far as how do we uncover that we really truly have the right need? So this is an interesting, right? Because it's going to depend a little bit on what you're selling and who you're selling it to and all of that stuff. But as a general rule of thumb, um, what we're looking for is the, the greatest need that they have that we can solve for. So more junior reps will make this mistake. They're just looking for, they're just looking for anything, right? Like I, I just want them to be interested. Them being interested is not enough, right? We need a problem that we can solve that we're really good at. Um, that when we look at case studies and we look at our own use cases and we understand that we actually truly solve this problem for them um, without leading the witness to it, right? So what are all of the different triggers that lead to that problem um, that we can really identify what is the cost of problem that we can solve for? Um, so I think that that sounds very general, but it's it's a very it's a very basic thing that people often miss. Um, we need to make sure that this is a problem that is worth them solving. If they if it's not worth them solving it, they're not going to put any money into it. They're not going to put any money into it. There's no reason for them to have this conversation with us. How do we know? Again, it seems like a simple question, but I imagine it's quite profound, the answer to it. How do we know whether it's a problem that is worth them solving? Because we, and, and from the context of, as a salesperson, we think the problem that we solve, because we're indoctrinated by the company that we work for, that we're the greatest freaking thing of all time. How do we know whether that is actually a problem that, they care about, we can help them care about and, and shine a light on it. And then that they do actually care about it, if that makes sense. So there are so many different tech, uh, techniques and tactics to use on this one. What has worked for me? Um, and everybody's going to have a slightly different way of doing this. But what has worked for me is to simply ask, 
So if you don't solve this problem, what's what are the consequences? Um, and you can play around with it in tone. Some you can make it either more aggressive or less aggressive. For me, typically when I'm getting to that question, I don't want them to be defensive. I want us to be both on the same side of the table. I want us to understand that we are solving a problem that they have. Um, and I don't want to waste time if it's not a problem <laughs> that they actually are interested in solving right now. Um, so my tone on that tends to be fairly conversational. Um, you know, I might even say up front, you know, if this is, I, I'm trying to understand your, your priorities so, because if this is a lower priority, this is something that, you know, maybe we can talk about later. If this is a higher priority, we need to take care of this today. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very conversational. It's very matter of fact and, and blunt. You know, what, what is, what is the consequence of not solving this? What's going to stand in your way of solving it? Because every question should be followed by another question, right? Um, what are the other organizations within your company that need to be involved in solving it? Um, do they have different priorities that are going to prevent us from solving it? So making sure that it's not just one question, but it's multiple questions, one kind of rolling into the other that are going to uncover how big of a priority it is. Is this something that's already been identified as, as something that needs to be solved for? Who else is going to be in, in the decision making process? And really, what are those things that we're, what are those walls that we're going to, that we're going to run into? What do we do if, and I'm going to paint a picture here that won't happen every time, but I've definitely faced it. What do we do if, I'm, I'm using my language carefully here, and maybe I shouldn't. What do we do if we're opposite someone who is a bit of a job's worth, a bit of an idiot, they, the company could massively benefit from using our product or service, <laughs> but we're, and, and this comes, and we take responsibility for this. We, we can't influence them. We can't help them see that the problem is there. We can't help, and again, they're an idiot, but it's our fault. Well, let's frame it like that. We can't help them get over that. What What are the options then? Is it worth kind of trying to go around them? Is it worth going over them? Is it just a lost cause? Does it just mean that we've not done our job well enough? We need to spend more time and have another meeting. How, how do we deal with that scenario? So the first thing that I would do is I the first thing I'm going to say and I love I love the language that you're using because um, they probably are being an idiot. But <laughs> the first thing for us actually to do is to check ourselves: Are they actually being an, in an idiot, or are they just not telling us what we want to hear? Right. So that is that's number one. Are we actually understanding um, why they are pushing back on this? Have we have we actually uncovered maybe there's another priority that's on fire right now? And yes, while we could help them, it's not going to see the light of day until that priority is solved. So that's one, right? So let's check ourselves and make sure that we are actually really listening to our buyer and understand their need. Um, but we go through that. We, we figure out that there's no other priorities on that are that are that are on fire. They're really just they're just being an idiot on it. Then yes, go around. <laughs> that is the time to start to start looking at who are the other people who would actually be involved in it. Once again, and I know I keep harping on knowing your buyer, but it's it's such an important thing. Um, it could be that the reason why they don't understand it is because you're not talking about the things that actually impact them. So, for example, if you are selling a product um, uh, that helps you, that involves uh, data reports, there are going to be two different types of problems. There's going to be the person who's reading the, the, the reports and who might not understand that the data that they have is often incorrect, right? And then there's the user, the person who actually runs those reports, who actually understands why it's so difficult to get the data correct. So you're going to have two very different conversations with those people based on how they're, how they're using that issue. They have different problems. And the person who's just reading the report might think that they don't need it because they don't understand that 80% of their data is wrong. <laughs> right. Done, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt. We've done quite. This just came to mind. Then we've done quite a few shows recently on artificial intelligence, things like this, sales stacks, technology, and I've done quite a few shows on the fact. And we kind of touched on it before we click record. Then that I very firmly believe that transactional sales will just disappear. It'll be a Facebook bot. It'll be something within within a very short period of time that'll take those roles away from actual people. But as we're talking about this, and I thought it was just worth highlighting then. What you're describing on, and maybe this is what you'd call like a multi-threaded approach to going into an account or an account-based selling approach. This would be very difficult for any bot AI to replicate because maybe the need on paper is obvious and um, 
how to describe it. it. It can be quantified, but a need for an actual person that you're corresponding with, you're going back and forth with is very different. And then you add not just one layer of complexity, another 50,000 layers of complexity when Bob wants this and Jillian wants something else. And they're not even the, they're the end user. They're not even the end buyer that we've got to get in front of and, and build trust and rapport with and, and show that we can see the project all the way through. So just to, just to tangent, just to go on a tangent for a second, Misha, is this something that we should be encouraging? Or is this something that we should be seeking out as salespeople roles that are complex, that do require lots of moving parts because they're the roles that will literally be around in 10 years from now? Absolutely. So from, and for multiple reasons, I mean, one, I think you're on to a very, very good point. These will be the roles that you can never have a bot do. This is not something that is that a computer is going to take over. So I agree with that completely. Um, I also just think it's a lot more fun, right? So just picking up the phone and giving them a price and closing it, eh, it's, it's good work, um, but it's not fun. You know, it will be, it will excite you for a year. But that after a while, you realize that you are doing the job <laughs> that a good computer can do. I think it's so much it's so much more interesting to, to really think about how you help an entire organization work together. Um, I think one of the biggest problems that we're facing today is that it's much harder for buyers to buy. And we actually have the opportunity to coach them through that. So it's not about using these slimy techniques and you know, it's, you know, and being, you know, that kind of that cheesy used car salesperson, it's about being very much a business partner who's coaching them through their buying process. Why is it harder to buy now? Um, and I, I think I know we're going to go with this, but I'll, I'll tee it up even further. The fact that there's so much content out there, there's comparisons, pricing's a lot more public, gay people, uh, salespeople aren't the gatekeepers to all this information anymore. We don't have that kind of ace in the hand of, uh, we'll give you this huge discount, we'll do this. Uh, why is it harder to buy now, considering all that is is kind of open on the internet? So I think that there's a, there's several things. I mean, so first of all, we obviously we know that it's so much easier for buyers to get information, and they are just there's it's an overwhelming amount of information that they have to to go through. So there's that. I think there's other things as well, though. I think that work cultures have become much more collaborative, and there is a much greater importance on. Do we have buy-in from all of the different groups who are going to be impacted by this by this product or solution coming in? Um, so I think having that more collaborative nature by na by its very nature makes it much more uh, difficult for buyers to buy. Um, I think the amount of competitive competitive companies that are coming into the space is outstanding. It's so much cheaper to build a company today and get it off the ground. You don't need millions of dollars to get a product started. Um, which means that we have a ton of competitors that are walking into the space and they're not very good at differentiating themselves. Um, it's hard for us to differentiate ourselves without using buzzwords. And that makes it really hard for our buyers to understand what makes one product different from the other. Yeah, I mean, and I'll, I'll leave it with this on, on that point. If you look at the sales and podcast and what we're building here, we get over 600,000 audio downloads a month. Um, I think we're about 100,000 views on, on YouTube a month and probably another 100,000 odd on Facebook. This set that we're in now, I've working with a guy without boring the the heads off everyone listening, working on a guy to get the colors right and all. And he's a he's a TV engineer and he's actually used these monitors on different um, production sets in, in the real world rather than the spare bedroom of this flat that I'm in. And he's kind of talking me through them and get the lights set up and the cameras and it's all balanced. And now the, the video is going to look 10 times better than it ever has done. If you tried to do all this kind of 10 years ago to have a set that is in this with these kind of cameras and 4K footage as well, you'd be into the millions. Whereas, you know, I've done it from not, I'm, I'm not trying to humble brag here at all, but I've done it from kind of nothing with living in my mate's kind of flat two and a half years ago to moving out to then to the bigger place, to the bigger place. And now we're looking at having an actual studio space of all this and more. So just to kind of quantify the fact that almost any in industry, you can have unlimited competition because almost anyone with the right skill set can instantly build a company, instantly get attention, which has never been possible before with the internet. Um, so this, the competition element of this is only going to get more and more crazy over the years to come. Um, and with that, Misha, I want to I want to ask you something specifically here, and I think this is going to be really valuable for the audience. Of how does the discovery process change as it gets more um, complex? And what I mean by that is, you speak to Sally, the end user, 
and she wants more time. She's sick of getting, uh, if you use uh, the data example used before, she's sick of getting really crappy data that she struggles to do her job with. So we can solve that data problem because we have a, we're, we're, we're providing, we're selling a CRM, for example. Um, then that's one level of complexity. Then we speak to Jane, the CEO of the company, and she obviously has different um, needs and you know less on the how accurate the data is and more on the big picture, how she can expand market share and things like that. So she has that. And then this is, I've never really thought about this, but you, you added this layer of, of complexity to it as well. Perhaps a buying group as a whole has different needs, right? Because the swapping and changing, the group to proceed needs to know that across the whole board, everyone is happy. Everyone's happy. The, the cost of change is going to be appropriate. So that's another layer of complexity. So how does the discovery questions and how, how and maybe how we document this, how we project it back to the customer, how does all that change as we go from just pleasing one person and doing a deal to having to please 6.7 people to do a big corporate deal? Yeah, so so first of all, making sure that you're asking the appropriate discovery questions, which by the way, gets really hard when you have a bunch of them in the same room together. Uh, as soon as you have a bunch of them, you actually real you still at the same time have to make sure that you're asking that user level those types of user level discovery questions, and that person who owns the budget that you know the types of question that she actually cares about. Um, so making sure that you are asking questions that first of all you know why you're asking them. That sounds so simple, um, but how many sales reps actually look at their questions before they jump on the call and make sure that they actually understand why they're asking those questions in the first place? Is, is so, there a, sorry to interrupt, just on that, yeah. is there a rule that we should only ask questions that do X or Y, if that makes sense? Is is there, a, we should only ask a question if it, do, if it, for example, we should only ask a question if it moves the sales forward. That's not a good example. But is there a rule that we can kind of adjudicate some of our and judge judge some of our questions with? I like I do like to have a general journey, right? So we have a journey of questions that are leading us to to make sure that we understand everything that we need to to know, that we understand all the hurdles, we understand all the players, we understand that we are essentially moving the deal forward, right? So that I do believe in that as a whole. Um, do all questions have to lead to that? Absolutely not, because as soon as you do that. Um, you become a used car salesperson, right? And you become somebody who's not genuinely curious about that person and you're going to miss something. So journey, I like the journey um, so that from the beginning of the call to the end of the call, we are going on a very specific path. But then little devi uh, deviations here and there to, to, to answer the things that we that we might not have even thought about. That makes all sense. And I guess that is a, a that's perhaps your re rapport building questions or like we're going back and forth and, uh, I try and do this with the audience of so I'll, I'll I'll not keep it totally on track. I'll try and throw us one way or the other because that then re-gets the um, attention. I know when I listen to podcasts, if it's do X, Y, Z, one, two, three, I'd rather read it in a blog post. Perhaps it's less engaging. Um, yeah, okay. Bullet, just bullet points. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and bullet points are useful. And then you need another four podcasts to go into each of the bullet points and it all, it all gets um, difficult to follow <laughs> at that point. So with that then, Misha, how do we document some of this? Because if if we know that Sally wants to expand market share, our CRM is going to give her sales team the data to go after the customers to do that. If we can write that in some kind of document, whether it's an email, whether it's, hey, Sally, you said this, you said, I asked you the question of, um, you know, what's the biggest problem that we could solve? And we agreed that we could solve it. And you said that we could do this. It's going to make you money. It's going to reduce... Um, sales turnover of staff, whatever it is, that's, that's clearly in a written document. You said this, you agreed is crazy powerful. So how do we document this as we go through? And is there, an, is there an end product that for a big corporate sale that we should be putting together some kind of documentation of we've ticked all these boxes. There's no reason not to move forward, I guess, is, is the kind of paperwork that I'm looking for. Yeah. So there's, there's two things. So first of all, I do love the email. Um, even if, by the way, even if you get it wrong, I feel like sometimes uh, reps uh, don't want to do the email because they might have misheard something. I once spent, there was a, a somebody who was trying to sell me. Um, he sent me an email and he got it completely wrong. Do you know, I ended up spending a half an hour on that email, just recreate a half an hour. I, I, I was late to a meeting. My undivided time was spent on correcting the information that he sent me. 
So not that you should send people wrong information, but even if you send it wrong, they're more likely to actually engage with you. Um, so I love the emails that have the follow up short, very short bullet points. I've seen multiple ways to have a working document that goes throughout the entire process. I love those. Um, and I've seen them as simple as on a Google Doc. Um, and the reason why I love them, um, the best ones are not just the sales rep writing it down. The best ones are it's a mutual experience between the salesperson and the buyer where both people are responsible for certain things. You know, one of the things, one of the ways to figure out if you're selling to the right person is can they actually get things done? If they can't get things done, if they don't want to get things done, that says something about the actual buyer. So this is a very early way to begin that process of we are going to have a collaborative effort and whatever technology you're using, using for it that is going to share with them where we are in the process. And this was the date that we agreed upon once we've decided that this is the right, that this is a problem that they have to solve for. This is the date that we're going, that we need to have it solved by. Um, once we start getting closer to that date, it helps us increase the, the, uh, the urgency of actually closing the deal because it was the date that they gave us. It's just, it's a much better process when we are engaged together. Should we always have, and we'll wrap up with this, should we always have a action that we give to the person that we're dealing with in that in the meeting, we ask a, a question that we know they're going to have to do some research for, they're going to have to make an introduction. We, we purposefully engineer that in so that, I guess it gives us two things. It gives us an opportunity to follow up of, hey, Sally, have you introduced me to Bob or can you get this data, which I need to plug into my calculations? Is that something that we should consciously put into our communication so that we've got a, both a follow-up and then I guess we're getting them invested into the process, right? As we as we ask for information, data, instructions, whatever it is after the after the meeting itself. Yes, with one caveat. Um, so the one caveat, as long as it's a true thing that we need them to do, right? So it's it's not making them busy just for busy sake is not going to help us move. And the reason why I say that it seems very obvious, but for anybody who is who is newer into sales, I see them do things like this, and they're not thinking about how busy that buyer is. <laughs> Um, right. And so we do have to take that. And if they're, and by the way, if the buyer's not busy, I wonder if we're selling to the right person, <laughs> right? We want to sell to somebody who's probably pretty, who is packed. Um, but yes, yes, 100%, as long as there is a purpose for it. And as long as we have a strategy for why we're asking them to do that thing. Amazing. The way you said that then, Misha, was that there was a clear example that popped up into your mind and I won't, I won't grill you as to what it was, but you're like, we've won cravat this is it. This is the, I've, I've seen this before. I've uh, either given or had this recommendation. So you can tell me off there perhaps what that mistake was from this, this new rep. Um, but with that, I've got one final question for you um, that will wrap up all the shows with. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be one piece of advice you'd give her to help her become better at selling? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I think that the one piece of advice that I would give myself is network with one new salesperson a week and ask what their best practices are. Um, when I was early in my sales career, I very much, I focused on learn, on figuring it out myself. I read books, you know, I, you know, I listened to things I studied, but there is so much to learn from the people around you. So that's what I would have done differently. One person a week for a coffee. Would you do, for anyone listening to this now, uh, who's, who's driving on the way to perhaps a, an office environment where they could literally be around the salespeople, would you suggest going to the, the top salesperson, just asking them for a coffee and go asking them, what, what would you ask them? Is it, is it, what is your sales process? What do you say on the phone? Where do you go with this? Is there any specifics in a 15 minute meeting that you'd want to pull out of that high performing individual? As small of a topic as, as humanly possible so that we can go deep in the weeds on it. Um, and something that I was currently struggling with. So, for example, you know, what, you know, I just want to go through your your favorite discovery questions. I just want to go through, you sell to marketing all the time. I'm about to start selling to marketing. Teach me about selling to marketing. Yeah, so it's one question, like just one thing that you can go super in the weeds to. I wish I had done that. <laughs> Amazing. Much better than Good stuff. Well, with that, Misha, you've got a boot camp coming up in London uh, over here in the U beautiful and rainy UK as I look out the window and it's, the weather's terrible. Um, so tell us a little bit about the boot camp where we can find more about it and, and everything that's going on there. 
Yeah, so I'm very excited to come to the UK with my partner as well. So Sassy Sales Management, we have different programs that help different groups. Uh, Matt Cameron will be there with his group that's supporting frontline sales managers. So managers who are who are, the fir- are managers for the first time and are trying to grow out their org. It's the best sales manager training program I've ever sat through. And then I'm joining him as well. And I'm doing a program purely on sales enablement. So for companies that are trying to figure out their own sales enablement strategy, so how do you build onboarding and ongoing programs, things like that, um, it's April 23rd and 24th. And would love to would love to see some good people there. I will link to both of them in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org. But are there any specific links you want to share as well for anyone who uh, wants to go directly to them? Yes, yes. I will so I will shoot those links over to you. Perfect. Well, but as, as, but, sorry, go on. But if you go to uh, sassysalesmanagement.com, uh, you can also see the invites on there. Good stuff. As I said, we'll link to all that and everything we talked about and some notes as well in this episode's show notes over at salesman.org. I mean, that means you, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for covering a lot of ground in this one. I appreciate the, the back and forth and the, the tangents. It's awesome. And with that, I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thank you.